Royalty 101. Royal Funerals. On the afternoon of September 8, 2022, Queen Elizabeth II of the UK died peacefully at her Balmoral estate. The plans for her funeral, Operation London Bridge, had been in place for decades and time to the minute. But a dignified, somber, and precise state funeral was not always how British royals of the past were buried. From grave robbers to wax effigies, pickpockets to runaway horses, let's recount the history of royal funerals and see how all of these traditions changed and culminated to create the rituals surrounding the funeral of Queen Elizabeth II. The 1066 death of King Edward the Confessor set off some of the most significant events in English history. After a series of strokes, the 63-year-old king died with his queen Edith by his side. But as he had been too pious to father any children with her, the succession was in jeopardy. On his deathbed, he named the son of his advisor, Harold Godwinson, as his heir. His Anglo-Saxon ancestors had been buried under funeral mounds with a great many rich possessions, including jewelry, weapons, and even chariots and ships. But by the 11th century, Christian kings were buried in abbeys. Edward's remains were dressed in fine robes, a crown placed on his head, scepter in his hand, ring on his finger, and more modest, Christ-like sandals on his feet. The corpses of early kings and queens were carried on flat, open pallets, sometimes wrapped in a funeral shroud, but usually with their faces and crowns exposed, so the people could see the dead royals. The funeral procession is portrayed in the Bayou Tapestry. The coffin was followed by a crowd of noble mourners who sat vigil and offered prayers over his body all day and night. In the time before refrigeration or embalming, this all occurred in just over 24 hours. Edward was laid to rest in his newly completed Westminster Abbey in a stone coffin under the floor. His coffin was filled with aromatic herbs and an elaborate shrine was later built above him. Harold Godwinson was crowned king in the abbey on the same day. The problem was that William, the powerful Duke of Normandy, also had a claim to the throne. He went to war with Harold, who was killed in battle. William took over England, earning the moniker the Conqueror. He spent much of his later years in France, enjoying the good life. While out for a ride, his protruding belly hit the hard wooden pummel of his saddle, damaging his organs. He died a few days later, age 59. Those in attendance at his deathbed looted everything from the king's room and scuttled off. The royal corpse was left naked on the floor. Eventually, a loyal knight took charge of the remains, had them washed and transported to the Abbey of saint Étienne de Camp for the funeral. During the service, a man piped up claiming that William had robbed his father of the land on which the abbey stood. He insisted that the king was not going to lie in land that didn't belong to him. After some haggling, the man was paid off. William's corpse, now bloated, wouldn't fit in his small stone sarcophagus. As it was forced in, the swollen bowels burst, and an intolerable stench assailed the nostrils of the crowd. The priest rushed through the burial rites so that everyone could escape the royal odor. William I's undignified end was seen as divine justice by the English people he had conquered. Fast forward to 1216, and King John was salty over having been forced to sign the Magna Carta and grant rights to his people. He decided to crush them back into submission. On the way to a battle, he took a shortcut and marched his army across an estuary. While crossing the narrow strip of land, the tide suddenly came in, the water rose, and they were trapped. Many soldiers, horses, and carts filled with the king's wealth, including the crown jewels, were washed out to sea. John drowned his sorrows in the kegs of a nearby abbey. The monk's brew gave him dysentery, and he died at 49. 
the people of London didn't want their despised king's body brought back to Westminster Abbey. So he was buried in Worcester Cathedral, in one of the few places still loyal to him. His son, Henry III, couldn't afford to have a fresh crown forged. Conveniently, the monks at Westminster Abbey claimed that the recently sainted King Edward the Confessor had long ago commanded that the crown and regalia he had been buried with should be used in the coronation of future kings. The monks looted the grave of the 200 years dead sovereign, and his crown, scepter, and ring were given to Henry III. The grave-robbed regalia made the basis of the crown jewels used to crown every monarch until the English Civil War. In 1649, Oliver Cromwell melted the historic jewels down to make coinage. Only one of St. Edward's gemstones remains in the royal collection. The sapphire reputedly taken from his ring is now mounted in the center of the cross atop the imperial state crown. Edward III, who was buried in Westminster Abbey in 1377, was the first king to have a funeral effigy rather than his actual corpse paraded before the public. These Madame Tussauds-like figures, carved from wax and wood, were impressively lifelike. They were often created from death masks, casts of the deceased's face, a tradition dating back to ancient Egypt. English funeral effigies were dressed in the royal's fine clothes and robes, with their crown placed upon their head. They were placed atop the coffin for the funeral procession and left in the abbey over the tomb after burial. Many medieval English monarchs were buried in Westminster Abbey, which has an impressive collection of effigies. Though circumstances or personal preference sometimes meant the remains ended up elsewhere. St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle was a popular alternative. Henry VIII was laid to rest there in 1547. His demise was kept secret for four days, while his nine-year-old son's uncle seized control of the regency. After the death was announced, vigils were held over Henry's coffin for ten days. With such a long lying in state, one might imagine that the royal remains got a bit whiffy. But the Tudors did have primitive methods of embalming. The bodies of the wealthy were washed in wine and strong-smelling herbs. Their orifices were stuffed with cotton and herbs, which covered up the odors more than prevented them. In some cases, mercury was poured into the nostrils and ears to keep the brain from liquefying. And entrails, which putrefy the fastest, were removed and the body cavity stuffed with more cotton and herbs. The organs were usually buried with the body in a separate box or urn, although sometimes family members would keep the heart as a memento. Henry's embalmed body took a two-day journey to Windsor. The funeral procession was as much a public spectacle as the king's life had been. A thousand mourners on horseback and hundreds more on foot stretched four miles behind the king's elaborate gilded chariot. It had a canopy about 35 feet tall and was covered in thousands of candles. Henry's coffin was draped in black velvet and heraldic banners and topped with an effigy of the king dressed in royal robes with the imperial state crown on its head. The multi-ton monstrosity was drawn by eight strong horses, ridden by eight children. The entourage stopped at Sion Abbey for the night, and according to legend, Henry's corpse, now getting a bit ripe, exploded, and his coffin leaked foul fluids. It is said that dogs licked up some of His Majesty's blood. This story of divine justice echoes that of biblical king Ahab, whose corpse was licked by dogs after he allowed his wife Jezebel to convert Israel to paganism, much as Henry had converted his own nation to Protestantism or Anne Boleyn. When the king's body finally arrived at St. George's Chapel 20 days after his death, his final queen, Catherine Parr, watched the masses from the queen's closet on the upper level, dressed in blue velvet robes and a purple bodice. 
Henry's coffin was laid in a vault under the choir next to his third queen, Jane Seymour, the only wife to give him a son. Queen Elizabeth I was even more fond of royal pageantry than her father had been. She died in 1603 at 69. Her body was placed in a lead coffin and carried by night on a torchlit barge down the River Thames from Richmond to Whitehall Palace. There, the queen laid in state, giving time for the new king, James I, to travel south from Scotland. Her effigy has been partially destroyed but recreated. Elizabeth's coffin was carried to Westminster Abbey on a hearse drawn by horses hung with black velvet. Above the coffin was a canopy carried by six knights. The queen was surrounded by gentlemen pensioners carrying their axes reversed and knights holding banners, all dressed in floor-length black robes and hoods. The quantity of costly black cloth was strictly prescribed based on rank. Common people lined the streets to weep as the coffin of the great queen sauntered by. Elizabeth was buried at Westminster Abbey and eventually moved to an elaborate tomb in the Lady Chapel next to her half-sister, Mary I. King James I spent over £11,000, about $2 million today, on Elizabeth's lavish funeral. He would be the last monarch to have an effigy atop his coffin. His son, Charles I, lost the Civil War with Parliament and was publicly beheaded. His enemies conducted his body to St. George's Chapel, Windsor Castle, in a simple coffin draped in black. After a brief service, he was placed in the vault of Henry VIII without fanfare. A decade later, his son was invited back to restore the monarchy as King Charles II. His funeral in 1685 was considerably pared down from the Tudors, so as not to offend his people into another civil war. The elaborate gilt chariot was done away with. Instead, the coffin was draped in purple cloth and topped with a state crown, a tradition which remains to this day. There wasn't room in Westminster Abbey for an elaborate marble tomb, so instead, an artfully sculpted wax effigy of the king was positioned over his vault. His successor, James II, was kicked off the throne and into exile. He was buried in Paris and his tomb was destroyed during the French Revolution. The other Stuart monarchs, Mary, William, and Anne, were all buried with Charles II in the Stuart vault at Westminster Abbey. Stuart and Georgian funerals were conducted after sunset, and the processions were lit by torches. Women did not usually attend royal funerals, but for Queen Anne, many of her ladies insisted on being there. All of Anne's 17 children were stillborn or died tragically young. Eleven of their small coffins were placed in the Stuart vault with her. The throne next passed to her German cousin, George I. He died and was buried in Hanover. His son, George II, had the last royal state funeral held in Westminster Abbey. He had specially designed coffins made for himself and his beloved wife, Caroline of Ansbach. The sides were removed so that their dust could mingle for all eternity. By this time, Westminster Abbey was a bit crowded, so subsequent monarchs have been laid to rest in St. George's Chapel, Windsor. In 1817, Princess Charlotte of Wales, the only living grandchild of King George III, who was expected to someday become queen, died in childbirth at just 21. Her death was deeply mourned across the nation. The undertakers who handled the remains of the princess and her infant son were so distraught that they got drunk during the embalming. The crowd that came to Windsor to see her off was so large that they had to be cleared off by the royal guard so the torchlit procession could make their way to the chapel. Charlotte's husband, Prince Leopold, walked behind her coffin on unsteady legs. At the funeral of her unpopular father, George IV, the crowd was not especially mournful. In fact, they were so jolly and rowdy outside the chapel that the service was rushed through. Things got even worse when pickpockets descended on the crowd. 
in the past, it had been considered improper for the new monarch to attend the funeral of the old. But the new king, William IV, insisted on being there to mourn his brother. Queen Victoria died in 1901 at the age of 81. During her reign, the massive death toll of the American Civil War caused a number of changes in funeral practices, including the invention of formaldehyde embalming. Victoria herself was a bit obsessed with mourning, having spent 40 years grieving the death of her beloved husband, Prince Albert. She planned her own funeral decades in advance and expected it to go off without a hitch. She dictated the exact contents of her coffin. She was dressed in white, including her lace wedding veil, and surrounded by mementos. She took a lot of bling with her. She had rings on every finger, and her neck and wrists were stacked with necklaces and bracelets. She made a number of changes to tradition and set a new model for royal funerals, which remains to this day. She did away with the black cloaks and canopy over the coffin. Instead, her coffin was draped in a white pall. She wanted to be buried as a soldier's daughter, so her procession included more members of the military, while peers and privy councillors were excluded. A gun carriage conveyed Her Majesty's coffin. The procession also took place in the daytime, so it could be seen by a more dignified crowd. Victoria died at Osborne House on the Isle of Wight and was conveyed by boat and rail to St. George's Chapel, Windsor for the funeral, then to Frogmore House where she was laid to rest in a mausoleum with her late husband. She had requested no public lying in state, so the only public funeral events in London were the transfer of her coffin from Waterloo Station to Paddington Station. This proved rather unsatisfying for the grieving public. Victoria's meticulously planned funeral didn't go perfectly. The harness of one of the horses pulling her coffin snapped. The horses spooked and Her Majesty's coffin nearly shot off the back of the gun carriage and down a hill. To replace the undisciplined horses, a nearby contingent of sailors were employed to pull Her Majesty's coffin the rest of the way to the funeral. This tradition remains to this day. The funerals of Edward VII, George V, and George VI were all conducted following Queen Victoria's example. The major addition has been a lying in state in Westminster Hall in London to give the public a chance to bid their monarch farewell. A number of foreign leaders attended the funeral of Edward VII, but pride of place behind the gun carriage was given to his dog, Caesar. For George V, a new tradition was added, the Vigil of the Princes. His four living sons all arrived at his lying in state and stood silently at the four sides of his coffin. This tradition did not occur for King George VI as he had only daughters, but it did take place for Elizabeth, the Queen Mum, in 2002. Her grandsons, Princes Charles, Andrew, and Edward, and David Armstrong Jones took part. Only monarchs and occasionally highly distinguished figures receive state funerals. The most recent was for Prime Minister Winston Churchill in 1965. Other members of the royal family and distinguished persons are granted ceremonial funerals. Recent examples are Princess Diana in 1997, the Queen Mother in 2002, Margaret Thatcher in 2013, and Prince Philip in 2021. Princess Diana's funeral attracted massive crowds. The plans in place for the funeral of the Queen Mum, Operation Tay Bridge, were used as a basis. Her coffin was draped with the royal standard and topped with three wreaths of white flowers from her brother and two sons, as well as a letter from Prince Harry addressed to Mummy. Princes Philip, Charles, William, and Harry, and her brother Edward Spencer walked behind her coffin, followed by 500 representatives from her many charities. At the service in Westminster Abbey, Elton John sang a rewritten version of Candle in the Wind to commemorate England's Rose. Her body was taken to Althorpe, 
her family's historic estate, where she was laid to rest in a private family ceremony in a mausoleum on a small island in the center of a lake. Prince Philip wanted a simple funeral by royal standards. His coffin was carried on a custom Land Rover and topped with his naval cap and sword. The service at St. George's Chapel, Windsor had a limited guest list due to COVID-19 restrictions. The bereft queen sat alone. His remains were initially interred in the royal vault, but have been moved to the King George VI Memorial Chapel to lie next to his beloved wife, Queen Elizabeth. On the morning of September 8, 2022, the 96-year-old queen's doctors became concerned about her health and called her family to her bedside. Her son and heir, Charles, was nearby at his own estate, Burke Hall. He and his sister, Anne, Princess Royal, were able to make it in time to bid their mother farewell. Other family members had to take planes from London and arrived after the queen had passed. Operation London Bridge, the plan for the events that would follow the death of the Queen, has been in place since the 1960s when she was still in her 30s. The palace does like to be prepared. Meetings were held each year to update the plan to its current iteration. Upon the moment of the Queen's death, her heir apparent, Charles, became king. Some unknown time later, the Queen's private secretary informed the Prime Minister of her death. The Foreign Office informed leaders of the Commonwealth realms, and then a news flash was sent to the Press Association. Media outlets were prepared with somber statements, black suits, and biographies. A black-edged notice was pinned to the gates of Buckingham Palace. Across the country, flags were flown at half-mass and bells tolled out. The next day, King Charles III made his first address as head of state. Members of the royal family have gone out on several occasions to greet the public and view tributes. On Saturday the 10th, the Accession Council, which has its roots in Anglo-Saxon times, met at St. James's Palace to proclaim him king. The new king departed on a tour of the UK, visiting Edinburgh, Belfast, and Cardiff to meet political leaders. Concurrent plans were in place for the Queen's death at any number of locations, including overseas. Because she died at Balmoral in Scotland, Operation Unicorn went into effect. The royal undertakers, Leverton and Sons, arrived at Balmoral to prepare the Queen's remains. Her coffin, made from oak grown on the Sandringham estate and lined in lead, was draped in the Royal Standard of Scotland and placed in the castle's ballroom. On Sunday the 11th, the Queen's body was conveyed to the Palace of Holyrood House, the Sovereign's official residence in Scotland. On Monday, she was taken in procession along the Royal Mile through Edinburgh to St. Giles Cathedral. The hearse was followed by the Queen's four children on foot. In the past, it has been considered improper for women to walk in a funeral procession. Even at Princess Diana's funeral in 1997, her mother and sisters did not walk behind her coffin. However, Princess Anne has bucked this tradition. She walked behind the coffins of her grandmother, father, and mother. A service followed during which the Crown of Scotland was placed on Her Majesty's coffin. The Queen remained lying in state in the cathedral for 24 hours. 20,000 people lined up to pay their respects. That evening, the King, Princess Anne, Prince Andrew, and Prince Edward conducted the Vigil of the Princes. Anne was the first woman to participate. On Tuesday, Princess Anne accompanied her mother's body aboard the royal jet from Edinburgh to London. The Scottish Royal Standard was replaced with the Royal Standard of the UK, and the coffin was moved to Buckingham Palace for the night. On Wednesday, the Queen's coffin, now adorned with the Imperial State Crown and a wreath of white flowers, was borne on the same gun carriage used in her parents' funerals. Members of the royal family walked behind the coffin in the procession as crowds lined the street. The Queen's body was taken to Westminster Hall, where it remained lying in state until her funeral five days later. Messages of condolence and rituals of mourning were carried out across the Commonwealth and the world. 
But there was also criticism of the British monarchy for their involvement in colonization and acts of violence, and of Queen Elizabeth herself for never acknowledging or apologizing for her institution's dark past, or giving back any of the jewels or artifacts stolen from other nations, some of which were prominently displayed in the crown jewels on her coffin. Members of the public waited for over 30 hours in a queue five miles long to go through airport-style security and then file past Her Majesty's coffin. On Friday evening, the Queen's four children repeated the vigil of the princes, standing guard silently at the four corners of her coffin for 15 minutes. Though the Vigil of the Princes was a 1936 edition, it has its roots in the Middle Ages, when family members and servants would keep vigil all night, praying and watching over a body so that it was not left alone until burial. On Saturday evening, the Queen's eight grandchildren, William Prince of Wales, Harry Duke of Sussex, Princess Beatrix, Princess Eugenie, Lady Louise, James Viscount Severn, Peter Phillips, and Zara Tyndall all repeated the Vigil of the Princes. Monday, September 19th was a bank holiday in the UK. At 10.44 a.m., the Queen's coffin was placed on the state gun carriage. As had been tradition since Queen Victoria, it was pulled by 142 Royal Navy sailors. Members of the royal family walked behind the coffin, which arrived at Westminster Abbey at 10.52. The last monarch to have a funeral at Westminster Abbey was King George II in 1760. Monarchs since have had funerals at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. This event has been added to give foreign dignitaries and the public more access to the events. St. George's has a capacity of only 800, while Westminster can hold over 2,000. 500 foreign heads of state and dignitaries and their partners attended the funeral. In the front row, to the right of the coffin, sat members of the royal family, including Prince William's two eldest children, George, the likely future king, and Princess Charlotte. To the left were royals representing all nine of the other remaining hereditary monarchies of Europe, all of whom are related to the late queen. The Emperor of Japan and King of Jordan were also in attendance. The Dean of Westminster conducted the service, and the Prime Minister of the UK and Secretary General of the Commonwealth read lessons. Prayers, sermons, and blessings were conducted by various churchmen and women. The last post bugle call sounded, and two minute silence was observed across the nation. The national anthem, Now God Save the King, ended the service at noon. The pallbearers were soldiers from the Queen's Company 1st Battalion Grenadier Guards, chosen for their seniority and similar height. The Queen's coffin was carried outside and back onto the gun carriage. It was then part of a one and a quarter mile, one and a half hour procession to Wellington Arch. The military band played, Big Ben told, and guns fired from Hyde Park. Thousands of members of the military marched in the procession, along with senior members of the royal family on foot and others in cars behind. Under the arch, the coffin was transferred to a hearse and driven the 22 miles to Windsor. There, the coffin was taken on its final procession along the long walk to St. George's Chapel, Windsor. The committal service began at 4 p.m. for the royal family, royal household, and leaders of the UK and Commonwealth. The imperial state crown, orb, and scepter were removed from the coffin. They will be used again in the coronation of King Charles III. The king placed the flag of the queen's grenadier guards on his mother's coffin, and the Lord Chamberlain, head of the queen's household, added his broken wand of office. The coffin was then lowered into the royal vault. Later in the evening, the royal family attends one final private service without the media present. The queen's body and the body of her husband, Prince Philip, who died in 2021, are finally laid to rest in the King George VI Memorial Chapel. The new king drops a handful of earth from a silver bowl onto his mother's coffin. And after 96 years of life and 70 years of service, she is finally laid to rest. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. 
If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.